Hello and welcome to the 2021 Kiev Jewish Forum hosted by the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine, the Center for Jewish Impact, and the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. I'm Nareet Ben. It is a pleasure to have you with us today for this prestigious third annual event. Each year, the Kiev Jewish Forum brings together prominent leaders and decision makers from around the world to open up about the most pressing issues facing Jewish communities worldwide. The goal to foster dialogue and help bring about much needed solutions to challenges like rising anti-Semitism, the growth of the anti-Israel boycott movement, and of course, the effects of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This year has extra meaning though, with Ukraine and Israel marking 30 years of official diplomatic ties. We'll take a look at how this vital relationship has flourished over the last three decades at Ukraine's storied history as a major center of Jewish life and its steadfast alliance with both the United States and Europe. We're live on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you miss anything, you'll get a recap in your inbox. Plus, a full recording of this two-day event will be up online on the forum's website, kievjewishforum.com. And now to officially open the forum, I'm honored to introduce an accomplished entrepreneur, philanthropist, and author, Boris Lozhkin, president of the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine, vice president of the World Jewish Congress, and founder of the Kiev Jewish Forum. Mr. Lozhkin, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Thank, Thank you, you for making this forum possible. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello, shalom, dear friends. I'm delighted to welcome participants of the past forums and also those who have joined our worldwide discussion platform for the first time at the third Kyiv Jewish Forum. The main reason for holding uh, this uh, forum is the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the State of Israel and the Ukraine, which will be celebrated in a few days. The President of the State of Israel, Isaac Gerzak, made his first official foreign visit this year, namely to Ukraine. Two years ago, when diplomatic relations were established between Israel and independent Ukraine, Chaim Herzog, the father of the current president, was the president of the state of Israel. There is a much closer connection between Jews and Ukrainians, uh, going beyond the geographical and the time frames uh, of this 30-year period. In support of this, I would like to give you one more example. Also, modern diplomatic relations between Ukraine and Israel were established uh, uh, the Ura on uh, December 26, 1991. De facto, it happened on May 11, 1949. Ukraine, as one of the founders of the United Nations, voted for the recognition of the state of Israel then. About 500,000 people who come from Ukraine live in Israel today. Our countries have agreed on a visa-free space uh, during these uh, 30 years, um, uh, established a free trade zone, have uh, become reliable partners uh, with each other in uh, many sectors, from agriculture and IT sphere to culture and medicine. The volume of uh, trade has already reached uh, 800 million uh, dollars, and uh, this is just uh, the beginning. During the third Kyiv Jewish Forum, our distinguished speakers will be talking about relations between Ukrainians and Jews wherever they live today, in Israel, the USA, Europe. We will also discuss the traditional, but unfortunately still relevant topic of anti-Semitism, including uh, in the uh, context of the coronavirus pandemic. The speakers will separately pay attention to the unique experience of Israel, whose citizens have become the recognized number one startup nation in the world. We will discuss this and uh, try to understand how the Israel experience can be adopted. In this uh, context, uh, one of the uh, panels will also be devoted to the spread of Jewish education as the basis of science, culture, progress and democracy. Before we start, I would also like to remind you of some of the events uh, in the life of the Jewish community of Ukraine that took place during this year between uh, the second and the third forums. In late September uh, and early October, Kyiv uh, hosted uh, events dedicated to the 80th anniversary of Babin Yar tragedy. In our opinion, the history of Babin Yar tragedy would be incomplete if we didn't honor the memory of also those who saved Jews. 
I would like uh, to thank Yad Vashem for the uh, provided materials which uh, formed the basis of the book Righteous Among the Nations, Ukraine, published in the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine in partnership with the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center and the Eurasian Jewish Congress. Uh, there are 2,674 stories of the Ukrainian righteous in it. By the way, this year on May 14, Ukraine celebrated the Day of the Righteous Among the Nations in Ukraine for the uh, first time. Another important event for Ukrainian Jews was the adoption of the law of preventing and the countering anti-Semitism by Ukrainian parliament. This law lays down in uh, uh, working definition of anti-Semitism by the International Holocaust Remembers Alliance. The principal position of the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, and the parliament members played a crucial role in the adoption of this important definition. I would like to thank the partners who helped organize the Kyiv Jewish Forum and prepared an interesting and diverse program for you. Combat Antisemitism Movement, Center for Jewish Impact and the Eurasian Jewish Congress. Well, let's begin. Mr. Loshkin, thanks so much for that and really giving us a little taste of what we have to look forward to in this forum, whether it is uh, the memory of the Babinyar massacre and looking behind or, of course, dealing with anti-Semitism today, which, as you mentioned, Ukraine is very active in. And, of course, we'll be seeing you uh, in a little while for this panel, a very interesting panel on startup and innovation uh, here. But for now, let's pause for a moment to welcome a very special guest to this forum, His Excellency, President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. He was elected in April 2019 after a career as a popular actor, screenwriter, and film producer. He's Ukraine's first ever Jewish president and a vocal advocate for strong Ukraine-Israel ties, who has also visited Israel himself many times. President Zelensky, it is an honor to have you addressing this forum. Welcome. Усім учасникам цьогорічного Київ Jewish Forum мої щирі, здоровенькі були та шалом. Всі ви, напевно, чули вислів, здається, ми знайомі все життя. На мою особисту думку, він як найкраще пасує до взаємин України та Ізраїлю. Незабаром від дня встановлення наших дипломатичних відносин буде 30 років. Але, здається, ми знайомі все життя. Тисячу років налічує перша письмова згадка на євриті про Київ. В Києві народилася Голда Мейер, поруч в Переяславі Шолом Алейхем, в Полтаві президент Ізраїлю Іцхак Бенцвій. На початку 20-го століття єврейська спільнота України була найчисельнішою і складала біля чверті усього єврейського населення світу. На території України зародилися хасидизм, сіонизм і ідеологія створення власної ізраїльської держави. Згідно Pure Resource Center, 83% українців позитивно ставляться до євреїв і один з найвищих показників у світі. Український народ пройшов голодомор, єврейський народ – голокост. Його жертвами у Європі стало 6 мільйонів євреїв, півтора з яких, тобто кожен четвертий вбитий, були саме з України. Майже 2600 українців – у достойні звання праведники народів світу. 14 травня ми вперше офіційно визначили День пам'яті українців, які рятували євреїв під час Другої світової війни. Сьогодні, до речі, реалізується проєкт «Праведники мого міста», який передбачає присвоєння вулицям, площам та скверам імен праведників народів світу. Ми нарешті будуємо меморіальний комплекс Бабен-Яр, який гідно позначається місце на мапі історії Голокосту. Ми знаємо, як це не мати власної держави. Ми знаємо, що означає захищати свою державу і свою землю зі зброєю в руках ціною власного життя. Нас розділяють тисячі кілометрів, тисячі кілометрів відстані і об'єднують тисячі років спільної історії. В ній українці та євреї завжди жили у мирі, у гармонії, у злагоді. Не бачимо жодних причин, аби не продовжувати таке спільне життя. Українці та євреї однаково цінують свободу і однаково працюють, щоб майбутнє наших держав було таким, якого хочемо ми для себе, а не таким, якого інші хочуть для нас. Ізраїль часто служить 
прикладом для України, але і ми не стоїмо на місці. За декілька років ми зробили вже більше, ніж за десятки років до цього, наймасштабніша в регіоні інфраструктурна реформа, наймасштабніший, амбітніший демонтаж бюрократії за рахунок розвитку цифрових інструментів. Ми почали справжню судову реформу, впроваджуємо зміни, щоб Україна стала найпотужнішим IT-хабом у Центральній та Східній Європі. Вже можна впевнено сказати, що бізнес Ізраїлю візьме участь, активну участь у цьому. Досвід і перспективи українців та євреїв відображаються чисельними зв'язками між людьми та громадськими ініціативами, втіленням яких є саме цей форум. У 2019 році в ньому взяли участь близько 500 лідерів єврейських громад з Ізраїлю, США та Європи. Рік тому онлайн-аудиторія форуму досягла вже більш ніж 80 тисяч людей по всьому світу. Але це точно не межа і Київ Jewish Forum має отримати дійсно глобальну вагу. And joining us now here in the studio, a man extremely well-versed in Ukrainian Jewish affairs, to say the least. Robert Singer is the chairman of the Center for Jewish Impact, a senior advisor to the combat anti-Semitism movement, and former CEO of the World Jewish Congress and World ORT. Mr. Singer, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. I know that your personal story is sort of very linked to everything we're talking about. You were born and raised in Ukraine before moving to Israel with your family as a teen sort of represents this very interwoven fabric of ties that we see between Ukraine, Israel, and of course, the Jewish people. Tell us a little bit what it means for you to, to be part of this forum. No, thank you, Nurit. Uh, it's really an honor uh, being here today representing the Center for Jewish Impact and the Combat Antisemitism Movement. We are very proud to partner with the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine and with its chairman, uh, my friend Boris uh, Loshkin, uh, and support the Ukrainian Jewish community at large which has always been among the largest and most important Jewish communities worldwide. The Center for Jewish Impact serves as a focal point and center of excellence for innovative and impactful initiatives that deliver benefit to Israel and the Jewish world through diplomacy and public policy. And the Combat Antisemitism Movement is a non-partisan global grassroots movement of more than 350 individuals and nearly 400 partner organizations across all religions and faiths united in a common mission of fighting anti-Semitism. The Kyiv Jewish Forum, organized by the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine for the third time, gives a voice to Ukrainian Jewry, and it has great personal meaning for me, like you said, as someone who was born in Ukraine and later had the opportunity to return to this country in the first group of Israeli diplomats who arrived there when diplomatic relations were established in 1991. At least half a million Ukrainian Jews live today in Israel. And Jews have uh, long served as a bridge between the two countries, bri uh, bridging them even closer together. And now I have a great privilege of introducing someone who has dedicated his life to the welfare of Jewish state and Jewish people. Before his election as president earlier this year, Isaac Herzog served as the chairman of the Jewish Agency for Israel, following up a distinguished two-decade career in the Knesset, Israel's parliament. In October, President Herzog made an official historic visit to Ukraine, taking part in the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of Abinyar and the inauguration of a new memorial center at the site of the ravine where more than 30,000 Ukrainian Jews were killed. Your Excellency President Herzog, it's an honor to have you join us today. Dear friends, I'm so pleased to address the third Kiev Jewish Forum and take part in this very distinguished gathering. Thank you, Boris Lozhkin, Robert Singer, and Sasha Reutemann-Drava for establishing this forum and facilitating this significant platform for dialogue and education. As President of the State of Israel, I'm wholeheartedly committed to promoting and strengthening flourishing Jewish life from around the world. The key of Jewish Forum convenes an impressive and diverse group of leaders for discussions on the most vital topics facing the Jewish communities today and into the future. In fact, recently I visited the Kiev Jewish community with a big gathering of leaders from various communities and I was extremely impressed by its vibrancy and success. I would like to acknowledge President Volodymyr Zelensky 
for his participation in this forum, which sends a clear message about the significance of the topics at hand. Friends, as we look to the future, we commemorate our past. My visit to Babi Yar just a few weeks ago will remain with me forever. It is the most compelling of reminders that we cannot allow ourselves or the international community to disregard the deep destructive power of anti-Semitism. That we can never become complacent when it comes to threats of violence or hateful assaults against our sisters and brothers and against any human being. We must also reiterate that this is not just a Jewish issue. If allowed to fester, anti-Semitism ultimately lurks into other forms of intolerance and hate. It poisons our society, it damages us all. We must work together, all of us, to combat all hatred and ignorance and promote understandings and respect for all mankind and especially for all Jewish communities. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for creating this space for dialogue, discussion, and action on this issue and many other great significance issues to the global Jewish world. Stay safe and shalom from Yerushalayim. Thanks so much to Israeli President Isaac Herzog for taking part in this forum, adding his voice. And from there, we'll bring in some key voices from the country with the world's largest Jewish community outside Israel, of course, the United States. For the past decade and a half, American businessman and philanthropist Ronald Lauder has served as president of the World Jewish Congress, the self-described diplomatic arm of the Jewish people. Throughout his life, he's used his voice to speak out on behalf of Jewish interests around the world. Mr. Lauder, welcome to the forum. Thank you. It's an honor for me to be part of the Kiev Jewish Forum. I want to send a special greeting to my friends, President Zelensky, President Harris, all of the distinguished participants in the panel discussions that will follow. While this forum celebrates 30 years of diplomatic relations between Ukraine and the Jewish state of Israel, and that is certainly something to celebrate, this comes at a critical time for the Jewish people and the Jewish community of Ukraine in particular. Anti-Semitism is dramatically on the rise across the globe. The COVID epidemic has brought out the same blood libels first seen in the Middle Ages. The BDS movement seeks to delegitimize the Jewish state of Israel, and its lies are gaining traction, especially on the internet and on college campuses everywhere. Places that were once respected centers of free thought and learning, colleges and university, are now some of the least thoughtful places on earth. I never thought I would see this any time in my lifetime, but today, it's not safe for Jewish boys to walk down some streets of Paris, London, and even New York wearing a yarmulke. Those are just some of the challenges facing Jewish communities around the world in 2021. At the same time, I realize that Ukraine faces its own serious challenges, and this cannot be overlooked. The entire world is watching your borders right now, and we are hoping for a just solution without harm to anyone. I've always enjoyed my visit to your beautiful country, and I look forward to my return when the world opens up again. But it would be dishonest to say that relations between Jews and Ukrainians have always been perfect. They have not. Jews have been part of Ukraine for over a thousand years. Some of our greatest rabbis and yeshivas were located here. Jewish life was part of Ukraine. That can never be denied. It is also in Ukraine that we will witness some of the greatest tragedies. Just two months ago, we passed the 80th anniversary of the massacre at Babi Yar in the long list of terror that engulfed the Jewish people in the Second World War. There are some moments that stand out. Babi Yar is one of them. The unbelievable brutality of those two days must serve as a reminder to the entire world that anti-Semitism, even in its most benign form, can lead to atrocities like Babi Yar. I've always wondered, concerning the one that have million Jewish children that were murdered in the Holocaust, how many cures for disease and advancements in science and medicine were lost? How many symphonies and books were not written? 
How many ways would those lost souls have made the world a better place? That was a tragedy, not just for Jews, but for the entire world. That is why it's absolutely vital that today, when you hear something that is anti-Jewish, when you see something, say something, and don't be fooled. There is no difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Hatred of Israel is just a hiding place for those who hate Jews. Never let anti-Semitism, anti-Israeli lies pass without a word. Anti-Semites are cowards, and they back down when they're confronted. That is why I believe that they must always be stopped. And that is exactly what the World Jewish Congress does every single day. We confront anti-Jewish lies. We are laser focused on fighting all forms of anti-Semitism. We are supporting pro-Israel and pro-Jewish activists on campus. We are training our next generation of leaders with our Jewish diplomatic program. We are focusing on Jewish education for all young Jews. We are working with Jewish communities in 100 countries, and this includes the wonderful and strong Jewish community of Ukraine, led by Boris Lushkin. And you must do this as well in Ukraine. We will help you. Jewish students should, should be organized in Ukraine. I want to know how many Jewish schools there are in Ukraine, how many Jewish students, and that every young Jewish person who wants a Jewish education should get one. This is how we will build a stronger Jewish community in Ukraine. I also want you to find the young leaders in your community and train them. Any anti-Semitism in Ukraine must be fought, whether it's in the media, on the internet, on campuses, or on the street. And you must attack it with strength and resolve. A strong Jewish community, unwilling to be victims again, is the only way that we will defeat this new wave of anti-Semitism. Remember, we are not the ghetto Jews of old. That chapter is behind us. And we will never, ever go back there again. I am an optimist by nature, in spite of the challenges to the Jewish people that I have outlined. I believe we are stronger than we have ever been before. Today, we won't allow the indifference that the world showed the Jews in the 1930s. Today, we go directly to the leaders of the countries everywhere when there are acts against Jews. I have personally been to 40 countries, me with presidents and prime ministers. Now, we have a strong Jewish state of Israel, something that we could only dream about before 1948. After 2,000 years in exile, the Jewish uh, people have finally have come home. The establishment of the state of Israel is one of the great miracles of our time. We must never forget this or take it for granted. The Jewish people will survive. We have defied all the odds for thousands of years. And trust me on this, we aren't going anywhere. Let us work together as one people, one united people. That is the only way we will defeat this new wave of anti-Semitism. And that is what we will go forward today. I thank you for this important conference. I thank you for your participation. And I thank you for caring about our people. God bless you all. And may God continue to watch over the Jewish people in Ukraine, in Israel, and throughout the world. Thank you. I'm Israel Kai. And now, keeping focus in the U.S., we have the honor of being joined by Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. Senator Cardin chairs the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the U.S. Helsinki Commission. He's also a member of the Senate Ukraine Caucus and a proven friend of Ukraine and Israel with a solid track record of support for both countries on Capitol Hill. Hi, I'm Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. I serve as the chair of the U.S. Commission on the Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the U.S. Helsinki Commission. It is my pleasure to address the Kyiv Jewish Forum this year. I offer my congratulations to Ukraine and Israel on this 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between these two countries. 
that share so much history that is both tragic and triumphant. Today, we celebrate the special relationship between these two nations and the enduring support of the United States for both. These are challenging times for Ukraine. It confronts Kremlin-instigated war and occupation within its borders, the looming threat of an ever more direct military aggression by Russia, a constant barrage of propaganda demonizing Ukraine and its aspirations for Western integration, all while it struggles to overcome internal obstacles to development like corruption. The United States will continue to stand with Ukraine and help it improve both its military capabilities and systems of government. This year, we celebrate 30 years of Ukraine's independence. In September, we also marked a solemn anniversary for the Jewish people on the 80th anniversary of the Baba Yar massacre in Kyiv. The mass grave there is a painful reminder of the incredible human suffering of the Holocaust. We revisit these difficult memories so as not to forget the horrors, to prevent such a thing from ever happening again. The United States has long been committed to Holocaust remembrance, but we all must do more than just remember. We must continue to combat anti-Semitism in all of its forms today. I am proud of the United States' long-standing commitment to our democratic ally Israel, as well as our consistent advancement of religious freedom and the principles of tolerance here and abroad. There certainly is work to do. The anti-Semitism instances have increased since the turn of the millennium, particularly in Europe. And the Internet has provided a new breeding ground for anti-Semitic harassment and conspiracy theories. It has sadly become much easier to spread hate. In my special capacity as the special representative on anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance for the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, I have been drawing attention to the rising number of incidents of anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry and discrimination in Europe, Asia, and the United States. It is my hope that my fellow parliamentarians will consider implementing changes in their countries as well as the international initiatives we pursue in the Parliamentary Assembly. Breaking the cycle of hate starts at home. Political leaders have a special responsibility to denounce anti-Semitism and model tolerance in diverse societies. I hope to see that in Ukraine, not least of all to honor the manifold contributions of Jews to Ukraine throughout its history and today, and in Europe and more broadly, of course, in the United States. Thank you once again for your invitation to join you today. Thank you to Senator Ben Cardin. And during his decade and a half on Capitol Hill, U.S. Congressman Doug Lamborn, representing Colorado's 5th District, has been a strong voice promoting robust American support for both Ukraine and Israel. Since 2011, he served as co-chair of the Israel Allies Caucus, and in 2014, he co-sponsored a House resolution supporting the democratic and European aspirations of the Ukrainian people. Congressman Lamborn, thank you for adding your voice to this forum. I'll turn it over to you. Hello, I am Congressman Doug Lamborn from the United States. It is an honor to address you today at the third annual Kyiv Jewish Forum. Although I cannot join you in person, it is good to be with you in spirit, especially on the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Ukraine. It is wonderful that so many senior government officials from Israel are able to participate in this event, and especially so many senior leaders from the government of Ukraine. Everyone participating in the conference knows that this part of the world, while bountiful and beautiful, has historically seen more than its share of conflict. Located at the crossroads of empires and great powers throughout modern history, Ukrainians are justifiably protective of their independence. Having escaped the totalitarian jackboot of Soviet tyranny, at the end of the 20th century, our dear Ukrainian friends are haunted once again by the specter of Moscow's deadly intentions. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the people of Ukraine as tensions escalate on their border. I hope that my country provides you as much lethal military assistance as you need, with the ideal goal of deterring any conflict from even happening. Ukrainians are a courageous people, and I will do everything I can to ensure that you have the tools you need to maintain the sovereignty you were promised under the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances. Like their neighbors, the Ukrainian Jewish population are a resilient people. 
for over a thousand years since Constantine VII sat on the imperial throne in Constantinople, Jewish men and women have called Kiev home. Their industry and intelligence, familial fidelity, and unassailable faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob ensured those men and women of the diaspora who settled in the area were able to carve out a happy existence in the cities and towns across the Ukrainian steppe. In many cases, they flourished, but the Jewish population of Ukraine was not immune to the turmoil which engulfed the region in the Middle Ages, and unfortunately, a great deal of the violence and horror targeted them specifically. After recovering from the Mongolian occupation and flourishing under the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Jewish population would be targeted and devastated by the Himmelnitsky uprising and suffer along with the rest of the citizens of the Commonwealth under the deluge. In the 19th century, as the Ukrainian Jewish community again recovered and spread, the modern pogroms began. Localized at first with blood libels and mob violence, then state-run purges culminated in the worst horrors of the 20th century. But today, by the grace of God and the indomitable spirit and bravery of their people, the Jewish community of Ukraine remains alive and well. The history of Ukraine's Jewish population puts into stark relief the extreme dangers of anti-Semitism. Villainizing people based on who they are is the prerequisite for ethnic violence. The shocking evils we witnessed in the early and mid-20th century directed at Ukrainian Jews underscores the importance of never again. But never again can't be an empty and toothless slogan we recite at memorials. If we are serious about this statement, we must support the inalienable rights of Jewish communities around the world to defend themselves. Whether that means standing up for Israel and defending Israel at the UN, <clears throat> or reaffirming their right to exist and providing them the means to defend themselves, we must remain vigilant in the fight against the oldest hatred. Today, that often means defending the provision of American military aid to Israel from Democrats here in the halls of Congress, combating anti-Semitic attacks in broad daylight happening in cities across the U.S. and Europe, and fighting back against boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS, movements, whose ultimate goal is to economically destroy Israel. To this end, it was my honor to introduce the Taylor Force Act, which prohibits American taxpayer dollars from going to the Palestinian Authority until they cease paying a stipend to terrorists who murder innocent Israelis. Unfortunately, it appears that the Palestinian Authority is once again in violation of this U.S. law. The Biden administration must take action. This must not stand. Similarly, it is unfortunate that we must fight right now with elements of the Democratic Party to ensure that Iron Dome, an entirely defensive system, is fully funded. I am pleased to say that we were able to fully fund the Iron Dome and similar Israeli missile defense systems like Arrow 3 and David Sling in the fiscal year 2022 National Defense Authorization Act, which just passed. And last year, I introduced language into the defense bill, which will let Israel and the U.S. develop anti-missile laser technology together. I hope someday soon we can say that the Iron Beam is shooting down jihadist rockets over Tel Aviv. On that note, we must pause to recognize the great strides Ukraine has made. Ukraine has become much more welcoming and safe for their Jewish population. Even electing President Zelensky, their first Jewish president, a milestone even the U.S. has not reached. I applaud President Zelensky and his government for their efforts to make their fellow citizens welcome and Ukraine's ongoing good relations with Israel. How a nation views Israel and the Jewish people says a great deal about the character of that nation. And in recent years, our Ukrainian friends are emulating the noblest traditions of their country's history. As the psalmist said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Thank you again for allowing me to address your assembly. Let us continue fighting together against anti-Semitism and oppression in all its forms. May God bless the United States, Israel, and Ukraine. 
Thanks so much to U.S. Congressman Doug Lamborn. And let's now bring in another global perspective from the United Nations. Miguel Martinos is the U.N.'s High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations. He's a veteran European Union diplomat who, before taking on that U.N. role in 2019, worked to bring peoples of different nationalities and faiths together. Hi, Representative Moratinos, thank you so much for being here today and share with us your take as somebody studying anti-Semitism on really a global scale. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it gives me a profound honor to join you in this third edition of Kiev Jewish Forum. I thank the Center for Jewish Impact, the Jewish Confederation of the Ukraine and Combat Anti-Semitism Movement for inviting me to your forum which has become an important venue for combating anti-Semitism. I take this opportunity to congratulate the Jewish community in Ukraine and beyond on the occasion of the third anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Ukraine. It is a reminder of Ukraine's Jewish past. Distinguished guests, like many other faith minorities, Jews are subjected to hate crime, physical and verbal, as well as other manifestations of related intolerance. Antisemitic graffiti on synagogues, physical attack on Jewish people and their properties and strike site are blatant manifestations of anti-Jewish hatred. Such unjustifiable patterns fall within the context of racism and discrimination based on religion or belief. These are a violation of the right to the freedom of religion or belief. In addition, such acts often prevent individuals from professing the religion and practicing it out of fear, which is an infringement of Article 2 of the 1981 Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief. The absurd in anti-Semitic attacks and conspiracy theories around the Jews during the pandemic reminds us of the falsehood and conspiracy theories that resulted in the Holocaust. The hate against Jews that was manifested in the Holocaust still persists after 76 years. It has form, taken new form and used new innovative medium. The distortion of history and the horror of the Shoah is the most struggling of these four. I wish to reiterate an important point that I have often underlined. Antisemitism is a global problem. I say global because antisemitism is not a European problem, not a problem of the Jewish community alone. When antisemitism exists, it's in a society. There will be most likely other form of discrimination and racist ideology. Therefore, anti-Semitism and all manifestations of discrimination and racism are an upfront to democratic values, human rights law, and to the core values that the United Nations Charter upholds. When left un unaddressed, anti-Semitism poses a threat to the social cohesion and the stability of our communities. We should always remember that anti-Semitism doesn't occur only in countries where Jewish community live, but it's also present in countries where there are no Jews at all. The rise in conspiracy theories and hate speech online and offline and its mainstream media against the Jews during the pandemic were iterated by hate mongers who live in countries where there were only few Jews, live or not Jews at all. Therefore, my friends, to combat anti-Semitism, we need to adopt a global holistic approach rooted in human rights that brings together governments, civil society, faith communities, religious leaders, media, educational institutions, and municipalities. Education remains a crucial element in any approach we take forward in our effort to combat anti-Semitism. Part of that education is to preserve and disseminate information about the Holocaust and the testimonial of the survivors. It is so important our young people are able to hear such stories from the survivors themselves as a testimony 
to the power of resilience and endurance. Distinguished guests, the Secretary General of the United Nations has made attacking the root causes of intolerance and hate an urgent priority for the United Nations, including through the initiative like the UN Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech, the Call to Action for Human Rights, and the UN Plan to Safeguard Religious Society in the Fight Antisemitism. I applaud the incredible work of the Jewish Civil Society organization who had been doing a great deal of heavy lifting. It's also of collective duty to stand up and speak out against hate speech and attack on the Jews. You have my personal commitment to continue working with all of you to combat all forms of antisemitism. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to UN Representative Miguel Moratinos. And next, let's turn focus back to Ukraine. I have the privilege of introducing Prime Minister Denis Shmigal. An entrepreneur and politician, Mr. Shmigal has served as Ukraine's premier since March 2020. Prime Minister Shmigal, welcome to the Kiev Jewish Forum. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Let me turn it over to you. Шановні учасники третього Київ Джевіш Форум. Цього року Україна та Ізраїль святкують 30-річчя дружби, співпраці та взаємної підтримки. 26 грудня ми відзначаємо річницю встановлення дипломатичних відносин між нашими країнами. Для підтримання високого рівня партнерства та взаєморозуміння, яке існує між нашими країнами, потрібна постійна робота представників держави, бізнесу, громадських організацій, активна взаємодія на рівні людей, які мають спільні цілі та цінності. Тому ми вдячні всім єврейським організаціям, а також громадянам України та Ізраїлю, які допомагають підтримувати такий високий рівень відносин між нашими країнами. Для нас важливо надалі заохочувати контакти між громадянами, релігійними організаціями та громадянським суспільством з метою розширення і зміцнення дружних зв'язків, взаєморозуміння між українськими та ізраїльськими народами. Ізраїль та Україна – друзі і партнери у торгівельно-економічній, науково-технічній, медичній, культурній та гуманітарній сферах. Ми маємо багато перспективних напрямків для розвитку двосторонньої співпраці між нашими країнами. Окрему подяку хочу висловити Ізраїлю за незмінну підтримку суверенітету і територіальної цілісності України. Голос громадських та релігійних організацій в цьому питанні – також є вкрай важливим для того, аби в світі знали і розуміли, що Україна зараз бореться за свою незалежність. Я бажаю всім учасникам форуму здоров'я, оптимізму в ці непрості для всього світу часи. Якщо ми будемо діяти разом і з повагою і солідарністю, то зможемо подолати будь-які виклики та випробування. Thanks so much to Prime Minister Shmigal for taking part in this important forum. And we next have with us another voice from Europe, Italian Senator Lucio Malan, a prominent politician who has long been a leading pro-Israel voice in Europe. Senator Malan, welcome to the Kiev Jewish Forum. And tell us a bit about why you think this is an important conversation to have, especially from a Southern European perspective. Your Excellencies, Honorable Colleagues, Dear Friends, it is a special honor for me to be with you for this great event taking place in Kiev. As Europeans and as Christians, we owe special gratitude toward the Jewish people, the Jewish communities and the state of Israel. The contributions made by the Jews to our civilization are enormous. But as Christians, we have a special debt of gratitude because the roots of our faith, of our religion, are in the history of the Jewish people, of the people of Israel, contained in what the Jews called Tanakh and what uh, the Christians called the Bible, the first part of the Bible at least. And we owe even more this friendship, this solidarity, because of all the persecutions that have taken place in the last 2,000 years, when Christians have persecuted Jews, not only they committed a crime, not only it was against humanity, but it was against our own faith, because it showed that we hadn't understood the meaning of our beliefs. But the solidarity should not remain just in the good speeches, which are good things, but in the action. For instance, in the last two weeks, we collected the signatures of members of all parties, members of parliament of all parties, 
for a letter to the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, asking him something very specific. In the next session, the current session of the United Nations, we ask him to remember that in the last five years, 112 resolutions have been approved by the United Nations against Israel, while no other country has had more than 13, despite the fact that many other countries violate constantly human rights and the international laws. So not only we ask him, as should be asked to all the Minister of Foreign Affairs, not only we ask him to consider the content of each resolution that will be proposed, a content that usually is unacceptable and, uh, and false in its statements, but also to keep in mind that we should stop this uh, special standard, special, uh, special attention, bad attention toward Israel, because that is against what is right, it is against the purposes of the United Nations, and it is against the truth. When a UN resolution, for instance, denies the ties of the Temple Mount with the Jewish people, not only they are against the truth, not only they are against the Jews and against the land and the people and the state of Israel, but they are against the Christians because on that mountain, on that hill, Jesus went to worship and to pray at the temple with his followers. So we must uh, love the truth. We must remember that we are brothers. Christians and Jews are brothers and the elder brother is the Jewish people. So all the best to all of you who are gathered for such a good purpose. And as the Jewish people have said during the centuries, next year in Jerusalem. With that, we'll kick off our very first session focused on the challenges and opportunities facing Jewish communities worldwide in the year ahead. And there are many, among them rising anti-Semitism, the anti-Israel boycott movement, and of course, the impact still unfolding from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. It's, there's perhaps no one better to actually kick us off than Ukrainian-born human rights icon, Natan Sharansky, the ex-Soviet refusenik and former chairman of the Jewish Agency for Israel. As a young man, he inspired a generation of Jews and non-Jews alike with his stubborn fight for the right to emigrate to Israel. The price he paid for that fight included nine years of brutal imprisonment. Mr. Sharansky is now chairman of the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy and a Combat Antisemitism Movement Advisory Board member. He's also chairman of the Supervisory Board of the Babin Yar Foundation and Holocaust Memorial Center. Mr. Sharansky, it is an honor to have you with us. As always. Shanovni Pan President Vilna, Nezalezhna Ukraini, Vladimir Zelensky. My dear friend Boris Loshki, distinguished guests, the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Ukraine was a very, very important event in the history of our countries and the history of our people. The history of our people is very long, and also uh, thousands of years. And the history of our living with Ukrainian people is hundreds and hundreds of years. I was born in Ukraine, then Soviet Union, in the city of Donetsk, then it was called Stalin. Unfortunately, today Donetsk is the victim of the awful war, and uh, we can only pray and hope the peace will come to my native town. But then in those years, there were approximately half a million people, and maybe 10% of them were Jewish. But we Jews grew knowing nothing about our Jew Jewishness. That was the policy of forced assimilation of the Soviet Union. No religion, no culture, no tradition, no Pesach or Purim, no Brit Milah, or the only Jewish thing which we had was anti-Semitism, a lot of anti-Semitism. 
And so I believed that assimilation and anti-Semitism, that's natural state of Jews in Ukraine. Until I met other Jews, other Ukrainians, when I became a dissident in Moscow and among other human rights activists that I was working with, like Andrei Sakharov, I met with the Ukrainian nationals, those who were fighting for independent Ukraine. And I was very proud when, as a member of Helsinki Group in Moscow, I helped to the leader of Helsinki Group in Ukraine, Mikola Rudenka, to organize his first press conference and first contacts with the journalists and to tell about their struggle for human rights in Ukraine. And later, I met with many democratic Ukrainian dissidents in Gulag. And we had our mutual dream, how our people will live freely in their countries and how we will cooperate together. And I have to say, in all our scripts about the future, and we, Soviet dissidents, not like Soviet Sovietologists in America, we always knew that Soviet Union will fall. Because it was a regime which was spending all its energy to keep under the control to the brains of 200 million people. So we knew that their day, days are counted. And in our scripts, when we were discussing how the, it will start, it all started from Eastern Europe, and then the moment when Ukraine was becoming independent, that will be the end of the Soviet Union. And we hope that that will be like this. And, but also in our dreams, uh, in, uh, it, Ukraine was always becoming a very important country of Europe, like France, big population, very developed industry, agriculture. What is needed? It's not exactly what happened. But I'm proud to be the first Israeli minister who came in 1997 with the official visit to Kiev and signed the first trade agreement between Israel and Ukraine. And there were many industrials who came, who knew Ukraine before. Some of them were born in Ukraine, and who wanted to develop a business together. There was a lot of potential, and there is still a lot of potential which is not used. We have to seriously to think about why this potential is not used yet. And of course, one more change with the uh, Ukraine becoming independent, Jewish communities can live and develop freely as Jewish communities in Kyiv, in Dnepro, in Kharkov, in Lviv, in, ma in many other places. And they can uh, have natural connection with their families and their friends, uh, with other Jews in Israel. And that's a very important part of this life. And one more important change. Uh, Babi Yar was the, the symbol of the efforts of Soviet Union to raise the memory about the Holocaust. The biggest mass grave of the Holocaust, Babi Yar, became also the biggest symbol of the efforts of Soviet Union to destroy physically and to destroy the memory. Now I'm the chairman of the international group, which is trying to turn this uh, symbol of erasing of the memory into the biggest center of the study of the uh, Holocaust. Here is our first project, uh, synagogue in Babi Yar, for the first time. There are prayers every day in Babi Yar. So, of course, we are thankful, grateful, to Ukrainian government, to the Ukrainian leaders, all these changes in Ukrainian force. Of course, we encourage those Ukrainians and Jews who are trying to build strong bridges between us. But it's not so simple. There are many challenges. There is a lot of potential which is not yet used. I wish all of us a very fruitful conference. 
And now joining us is Michael Mirilashvili, president of the Euro-Asian Jewish Congress, a strategic partner of the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine. An entrepreneur and philanthropist active in both Eastern Europe and Israel, Mr. Mirilashvili is a generous supporter of education, welfare, and culture, along with Jewish heritage projects and initiatives. Mr. Mirilashvili, welcome. I'll turn it over to you. Я рад приветствовать организаторов и участников третьего Киевского еврейского форума. В первую очередь я хотел бы поблагодарить нашего дорогого партнера и друга, первого вице-президента Евразийского еврейского конгресса Бориса Ложкина, за эту важную инициативу. За несколько лет Киевский еврейский форум стал важным мероприятием в еврейском мире, и мы рады принимать в этом участие. В этом году форум посвящен 30-летию дипломатических отношений между независимой Украиной и государством Израиль. 30 лет назад для наших государств началась новая глава. Однако отношения между нашими народами складывались веками. История еврейского народа на украинской земле насчитывает немало времени, и Евразийский еврейский конгресс вкладывает большие усилия для сохранения исторического и культурного наследия украинского еврейства. Мы также уделяем большое внимание развитию общинной жизни и оказываем поддержку социальным и образовательным проектам на территории Украины. Мы искренне надеемся на дальнейшее развитие добрых отношений между нашими странами и между нашими народами. За последние годы Евразийский еврейский конгресс выступил партнером в ряде важнейших инициатив Еврейской конфедерации Украины, которую возглавляет Борис Ложкин. Недавно, к 80-й годовщине трагедии в Бабе Мьяру, мы издали книгу «Праведники народов мира» о гражданах Украины, спасавших евреев в годы Холокоста. В рамках проекта «Еврейская библиотека» на украинском языке в свет выходят лучшие книги по истории еврейского государства и биографии его лидеров. Еще одним важным совместным проектом стало создание Института исследования украинского еврейства при тель университете, задачей которого является изучение истории и культуры евреев на украинских землях от Средневековья до наших дней. Мы рады продолжать сотрудничать с Еврейской конфедерацией Украины на благо одной из крупнейших еврейских общин на постсоветском пространстве и признательны Борису Ложкину за большой вклад в настоящее и будущее украинского еврейства. Я желаю всем участникам форума успешной и плодотворной работы. Мы делаем важное дело, и с Божьей помощью мы добьемся успеха. And with that, I want to bring in another distinguished guest from Israel, the chairman of Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem, and Israel's former consul general in New York, Danny Dayan. During his time in New York, Mr. Dayan was on the front line of the fight against the anti-Semitic BDS movement and also prioritized promoting Jewish pluralism. Mr. Dayan, a pleasure to have you with, with us here. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you in this important forum. So, uh, Mr. Dayan, in recent years, we've seen everything from the distortion of the Holocaust to outright denial growing both online and offline. What's your take on why that's happening? And maybe more importantly, what can be done to actually fight back against the mainstreaming of that phenomenon? Thank you, Rick. Yes, uh, I would say that uh, I'm less concerned about the uh, outright denial of the Holocaust. Uh, uh, Holocaust denial was uh, somewhat uh, fashionable living in intellectual circles back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, we can, of course, see uh, Holocaust denial in the fringes, in the lunatic fringes of the social media where you can find virtually everything. But you know, I think that no respectable person will today deny that the Holocaust occurred. What we see today is a combination of both um, a, a trivialization of the Holocaust and distortion of the Holocaust. Uh, the distortion of the Holocaust is uh, basically based on this premise. Uh, nations, even governments and uh, important social groups say, of course, the Holocaust occurred, of course, there were gas chambers and extermination camps, and six million Jews were exterminated. But uh, that was an endeavor done only by the Germans. 
they didn't have collaborators. At least everyone says in my country they didn't have collaborators. Uh, that is wrong. Uh, basically, in all European countries, uh, the German Nazis had uh, local collaborators. And we have to, you know, we have to say we expect from every single country uh, those that uh, we really embrace in the family of democratic nations, uh, we expect from them to look uh, uh, into their past uh, without any uh, uh, reservations and admit if there were wrongdoings. Obviously, there were in many cases also very important uh, positive things that were done. Um, and we see, obviously, uh, as uh, uh, you said, uh, the, the trivialization of the Holocaust. The trivialization of the Holocaust was is rampant, especially now with the COVID pandemic. Uh, those comparisons, those outrageous comparisons between uh, 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 green passes for vaccinated people to the uh, yellow star that Jews uh, had to wear during the, the Shoah, the Holocaust. This is really outrageous. We saw it even on, on, on mainstream television with the Fox News, uh, 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 and a, a reporter compared uh, Dr. Fauci to, to the infamous uh, Josef Mengele. And the worst trivialization or distortion of all is, of course, uh, those uh, um, terrible comparisons that have no basis on reality between Israel and uh, uh, the dark days of the Holocaust. Uh, that is uh, uh, probably uh, the most uh, uh, outrageous of all uh, distortions and trivializations of the Holocaust. So, Mr. Dayan, with, with those examples, and you're right, I mean, there's really hardly a day you can look at Twitter, for example, without seeing a photo of uh, somebody, you know, with a, with a yellow star comparing modern-day vaccine mandates uh, to the horrors of the Holocaust. What is your recommendation to do about that? I mean, it, whether it's a, on a community level or, or a national level, for that matter. Um, we expect, uh, first of all, leaders, leaders to be clear about those issues, uh, influencers in uh, civil society to be clear about those issues, uh, to, to, to denounce them, to, uh, re to rebut them, to repeal them, to uh, fight them. Um, if uh, uh, serious persons uh, do their, uh, decent persons do their work, um, I think uh, we will uh, uh, overcome. So I want to ask you more specifically about Babinyar, because if we're talking about Holocaust memory, obviously education and, and in combating the phenomenon you're talking about, education is so important. And the massacre at Babinyar is, is less well known broadly. I mean, certainly less well known than the concentration camps and, and even, you know, the notion of Auschwitz, for example. Why is it so important to, to commemorate what happened there? And, and what do you think, you know, what, what is being done to really draw more attention to that chapter of history? Well, you know, Norit, I had the privilege in my first uh, trip abroad uh, as chairman of Yad Vashem to be in Kiev for the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the Babi Yar massacre, uh, together with President Herzog. Uh, by the way, Kiev is also uh, the city in which uh, my father was born uh, uh, in 1920. Um, so it was also a personal experience, a very significant personal experience for me to return to Kiev. Um, but uh, uh, I will tell you, the reason probably is that the, that the Auschwitz became a symbol. Well, of course, more people, much many, much more people were massacred in Auschwitz than in the in the shooting pits uh, uh, of Babylon. But uh, uh, probably because the uh, in the pre uh, uh, in the during the Iron Wall days, uh, most of the research in the West was about the, the Holocaust, the, the Western Jews uh, uh, of Europe that was carried out in, in extermination camps uh, when uh, uh, the, the, the Eastern, Eastern Europe became democratic and the research flourished, uh, then uh, much more uh, relevance and importance uh, was attributed to Babin Yar and other uh, shooting uh, pits in, in, in what is called the Holocaust by bullets. Um, but uh, Babin Yar is historically extremely important. Basically, in September 1941, uh, the systematic, uh, the machine of murder uh, by the Nazis uh, started. And uh, from an historical point of view, uh, Babin Yar, although it was not the first massacre by bullets, uh, it uh, was a watershed moment in the tragic history of uh, the Shoah of the Holocaust. 
So, Mr. Diane, before we let you go, you've spoken to this a little bit. You've already answered this in one way, but maybe you can speak more broadly to it. As the head of an institution tasked with preserving the memory of a Holocaust, which is, you know, quite a lofty uh, task, what would your demand or your recommendation be of world leaders? Uh, look, Norit, I would say that uh, uh, I will tell you what I tell uh, the many world leaders that visit Yad Vashem in uh, official or other visits uh, to Israel. Uh, there are many lessons to the Holocaust. I'm not uh, implying that there is one and only lesson to the Holocaust, to the Shoah. Uh, and as long as decent people uh, uh, learn lessons, um, draw up those lessons, uh, all of them are uh, legitimate. Uh, our lessons, my lessons are basically two. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, how important, how existentially important is the, the, uh, the establishment of a Jewish state, an independent, robust, secure Jewish state. We all were wandering in the St. Louis ship from port to port and denied entry to every country in, in North America, in the Caribbean, in South America, until they returned to Europe to be uh, massacred by the Nazis. The existence of a Jewish state is the only guarantee that it will not happen again. And the second thing, and probably very relevant to, to the deliberation of this important forum today, is that, and I say to world leaders, the moment you see the first signs of anti-Semitism, the moment you see the first signs of a, a genocidal uh, statements against the state of Israel and the Jewish state, Act immediately, act forcibly, act without any reservations. We have the experience that the world didn't have in the 1930s. We today know to what monstrous uh, uh, dimensions uh, anti-Semitism and genocidal statements can grow. Um, we don't have the luxury to say we didn't understand that it can grow to those dimensions. After the Holocaust, we should know, and I expect from world leaders to, co to confront those uh, uh, phenomena forcibly, strongly, decisively, and immediately. Mr. Danny Dayan, thank you so much for, for your words and uh, re really practical recommendations, I should say, that are so relevant to what we see now and really tie back to, to the mainstreaming of the distortion of the Holocaust you were talking about, how that happens bit by bit and ends up having such a massive impact. Thanks so much for being with us. And of course, we invite thank you, you so to, much. to stay, you stay with me. us. And, uh, and listen to the following guests we have. We're going to be doing a lot more conversation, certainly about uh, anti-Semitism today and the relationship between Israel and Ukraine. Next, let's turn our focus back to the United States, where we'll hear from American Jewish Committee CEO David Harris. During his three decades in charge of the AJC, Mr. Harris has been one of the most visible and effective advocates for the Jewish people, both in the U.S. and around the world. He shares this message reflecting back on that time and of course, looking ahead. Dear Boris Loshkin, dear Jewish Confederation of Ukraine, dear friends, Tarigir Druzia, I'm David Harris, the CEO of American Jewish Committee, and it's my pleasure once again to speak to you at the Kiev Jewish Forum. I'm grateful for the invitation. But this time, unlike the previous occasions, I'd like to go in a slightly different direction. And the reason is really quite simple and straightforward. This will be my last opportunity to speak at the Kiev Jewish Forum in my current role at the American Jewish Committee. So allow me to look back and then to look ahead. In 1974, I first traveled to the Soviet Union on a U.S.-Soviet exchange program as a teacher. I spent several months in Moscow and Leningrad, and eventually I was expelled from the country. But that came only after I had met with Soviet Jews, many brave, courageous, heroic Soviet Jews in both cities who were determined to keep Jewish identity alive under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. Seven years later, I was able to return to the Soviet Union and for the first time visited Kiev. And during that visit to Kiev, again in those dark Soviet times, I was able as well to visit Babi Yar. At the time, as many of you know, the monument at Babi Yar had the words Kshortvam Fashistov, to the victims of fascism, 
with no reference to the Jews, the tens of thousands of Jews murdered there. So when 1991 came around, those dramatic events, we at the American Jewish Committee and I personally took a very special interest in supporting the rebirth of independence in Ukraine. We publicly called on then President George H.W. Bush to do what he was reluctant to do and to extend American support for Ukrainian independence. We were proud when the United States did it. And from that day forward, 30 years now, we have been supportive of Ukraine's efforts, not just to reestablish its independence, but to chart a path of peace, prosperity, security, stability, and open relations with those countries it wishes to. Of course, there have been obstacles. I remember in 1994, the signing of the Budapest Memorandum, when Ukraine willingly gave up its own nuclear arsenal from Soviet days in exchange for guarantees from the four signatory countries that Ukraine's territorial independence and sovereignty would be guaranteed. Well, we saw what happened when that was later tested. Fast forward to the days of Maidan, 2014. Again, we at American Jewish Committee were strongly and openly supportive of the Ukrainian efforts to establish their own destiny and not to be bullied by neighbors. And that's why we appointed Dr. Sam Klieger of the AJC staff to travel to Kiev and to open our office as a gesture of solidarity and support for what was happening in Ukraine. I believe we were the only such organization in the world to do so. And together with Ukrainian American and other interested organizations in the United States, we pressed the Obama administration to be more supportive of Ukraine's need for defensive weapons. And most recently, I had the privilege of returning to Kiev, this time for the, um, the opening of the extraordinary new exhibits uh, at Babi Yar. And this time, it's not just about references, fascistov. This time, it's about appropriately, if belatedly, commemorating the tragedy that took place at Babi Yar. I know full well that the history of Ukraine with respect to Jews has often been a very difficult and complicated and painful one. And I also know full well that the journey of Ukraine from 1991 until today has also not been an easy or linear path. But I do know that things are headed in the right direction. I do know that Ukraine has witnessed the rebirth of an extraordinarily vibrant an important and large Jewish community. I do know that Ukraine has strong bilateral relations with Israel and increasingly has shown in its voting record at the United Nations a willingness to, to express support for Israel, uh, even when it may not be ex politically expedient to do so. I do know that Ukraine seeks closer relations both with the European Union and the United States. And I do know that Ukraine continues to wonder what happened to those guarantees in the 1994 Budapest Memorandum. Even though I will be leaving AJC, I hope that our organization will continue to be supportive of those core pillars and principles of Ukrainian rebirth, independence, prosperity, including a, an energized Jewish community. And I also know something else, which I believe is important for all of us to remember. Going back again to those dark days of 1974 and 1981, and all the other years of that Soviet era, what's been accomplished is nothing short of remarkable. We, the Jewish people, must never lose sight that it was the Soviet intention to extinguish the last vestiges of Jewish identity on Soviet soil. And yet we witnessed in 1991 the last vestiges of Soviet power and the rebirth of Jewish life in Ukraine and elsewhere in the former Soviet Union. And Ukraine, has, from having been an implacable foe of Israel in the Soviet days, has now become a friend and partner. History can move forward. 
and the example of the Jewish community of Ukraine, represented here by the Jewish Confederation and other institutions, should be a reminder, an inspiring reminder, of what's possible. We Jews say, Ani Ma'amin, I believe. I believe from everything I've seen and learned from the experience of Ukraine and the Jewish community that the Jewish future, whether in Ukraine, in Israel, here in the United States or elsewhere, can be bright. Together, let's ensure that the best days of the Jewish people lie ahead of us. Goodbye, shalom, tosvidanya from New York. And with us now from Washington, D.C., another key figure in U.S. Jewry. William Deroff is CEO of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. Welcome to the Kiev Jewish Forum. You have decades of experience working with Jewish organizations in the U.S. You're intimately familiar with the challenges and opportunities they face right now. Uh, William, tell us, what are really the priorities in your eyes? It is a pleasure to address this forum with leaders from around the world as we recognize the 30th anniversary of Ukraine's independence and the 30th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Israel and Ukraine, as well as the trilateral relationship between the United States, Israel, and Ukraine. The fate of our Jewish brothers and sisters everywhere in the world is of great importance to the American Jewish community. Our connection to this part of the world is particularly poignant, as many of us trace our lineage to the region. Jewish organizations in the United States labored tirelessly to secure the rights of refuseniks. We then participated in the rebuilding of Jewish life in the former Eastern Bloc in the 1990s and have remained deeply engaged in such efforts. The commitment to Jewish life around the world is a priority for the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, 53 national Jewish organizations, which represent the full spectrum of American Jewish religious, political, and ideological life. We also share a commitment to fighting the worldwide increase in anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, which never completely disappeared, has returned with a vengeance. We are now experiencing here in the United States what many of our European brothers and sisters have experienced for the last 20 years. This new anti-Semitism is a composite, if you will, a hodgepodge combining age-old racial and religious enmity towards Jews with two new elements. The first of these complains that the Holocaust memory itself is excessive, obscuring atrocities committed against other groups, serving the interests of an imagined Jewish lobby. Denial and lack of awareness of the Holocaust persists, and we must face the unending work of ensuring that the memory of those who perished is remembered. The second element of this new anti-Semitism, appearing under the guise of anti-Zionism, proceeds to heap upon the state of Israel accusations that were once leveled against Jews. While it is impolitic to call someone a dirty Jew, the haters simply call us dirty Zionists, unfortunately with impunity in far too many circles. Anti-Semitic acts and incidents are occurring with alarming frequency, not just in America, but around the world. Anti-Semitic incidents spiked here in the United States during the violent conflict between Hamas terrorists and Israel over the summer. And far too often, public support for Israel has resulted in the deliberate exclusion of Jewish student and activist groups from involvement in traditionally progressive organizing spaces. We know this phenomenon has been a problem in Europe for far longer. But there are reasons for hope. The Conference of Presidents last week joined a coalition of over 60 civil society and non-governmental organizations committed to the fight against anti-Semitism in the Shine a Light campaign. The Shine a Light initiative, launched this Hanukkah, takes a comprehensive approach to combating anti-Semitism by advocating for necessary policy changes at the governmental level, as well as rooting out cultural forces that contribute to hatred against Jews in education and in civil life. One critical tool at our disposal is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. The IRA definition of anti-Semitism provides a framework to identify instances of anti-Semitic behavior, including when criticism of Israel's policy or the actions of the Israeli government veer into anti-Semitism. Such criticism and denying Israel's right to exist or rejecting the right of self-determination for the Jewish people. We applaud the passage of anti-Semitism legislation in Ukraine this year and ask the Ukrainian government to take it one step further by formally adopting the IRA definition. We appreciate governments around the world, over 30 of them, who are using the IRA definition of anti-Semitism for education, training, and determining hate crimes and discrimination. In this critical fight, we must clarify what constitutes anti-Semitism and remain vigilant for mutating forms of anti-Semitic hatred so that we can all avoid being bystanders in our communities. 
we can, in concert with each other, make meaningful progress against anti-Semitism and other forms of bias and discrimination. The danger will not recede unless we act against it. And in doing so, we act not only for ourselves, but for everyone in our entire society. No one is ultimately safe in an environment where hate freely circulates. This year, let us take action against anti-Semitism and the challenges that face Jewish communities across the world. American Jewish organizations will continue to defend the state of Israel against delegitimization and reinforce relations between the diaspora and the Jewish state, and this includes the trilateral relations between Israel, Ukraine, and the United States. We are pleased that Ukraine joined the United States and Israel in not attending the UN Durban conference earlier this year. Ukraine's support for Israel at the United Nations has not gone unnoticed, and we thank President Zelensky and the Ukrainian government for continuing to strengthen the Ukrainian-Israeli relationship. It was an honor to be in Kiev a few months ago at Babi Yar with members of the Ukrainian Jewish community, American Jewish leaders, world leaders, and leaders of Israel. We're pleased that President Zelensky provided a formal endorsement on behalf of the Ukrainian government and look forward, finally, to the completion of the Babi Yar Memorial. Now that the pandemic has begun to subside, I hope, too, to see many of my friends and colleagues at this conference in person next year. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to work together as partners and engage here and now on the issues of our time, especially the critical issues of fighting anti-Semitism. And I'm deeply grateful for the relationships that unite and sustain us today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. And now among the U.S. organizations playing a major role in these issues is the Anti-Defamation League. They have long been a leading force in calling out and confronting anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry in the U.S. and around the world. ADL National Director and CEO Jonathan Greenblatt joins us now. Thank you, Nareed, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak at the third annual Kiev Jewish Forum. As many of you know, ADL is the oldest anti-hate organization in the world. We have been a leader in the fight against anti-Semitism for more than a century. And today, one of our top priorities is the most modern expression of anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism and hate that manifests online. For ADL, the online spread of conspiracy theories and hate, often leading to on-the-ground violence, has been shocking but not altogether surprising. We're seeing what once was fringe extremist and bigoted narratives become normalized, moving from the margins into the mainstream. In large part, that's because of social media's toxic business model that favors growth and engagement over morality and safety. No industry in the history of capitalism has ever exercised the power that these social media platforms command in terms of controlling the way the world communicates. Social media's amplification of extremism, disinformation, and conspiracy theories, and the complete and utter lack of transparency and accountability around how that amplification takes place poses, I would argue, one of the greatest threats to the safety of vulnerable individuals and marginalized communities worldwide, including the Jewish people. The recent uh, Facebook whistleblower, Francis Haugen, recently testified before the U.S. Congress and, indeed, before the European um, Commission in Brussels that an estimated 87 percent of Facebook's spending to address information was on English language content. Think about that. Nearly 90 percent was spent on English language content, despite the fact that English speakers are less than 10% of their users at Facebook. So ADL is looking around the world at this problem. We recently identified 39 separate Arabic language Facebook groups or pages with hundreds of thousands of followers that had titles that specifically were aimed at promoting the protocols of the elders of Zion. In another recent ADL study, we found 25 Spanish language anti-Semitic posts on Facebook that were from groups with a total of more than 660,000 followers and viewed well over 55,000 times. Anti-Semitic content seems to be given even more of a free pass when it comes from foreign leaders and refers to Israel or Zionists. Twitter shockingly still gives a platform 
to the major media outlets of Hamas, Hezbollah, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They use their accounts to glorify terrorism, to lift up martyrdom, and to spread absolutely horrendous anti-Semitic hate and conspiracy theories. Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei, the head of the number one state sponsor of terror on Earth, has well over a dozen current accounts on Twitter that he uses to not only promote Hezbollah and uh, Hamas, but where he routinely espouses genocidal language directed at the Jewish state and the Jewish people. We need to finally hold big tech accountable for their role in fracturing democracy and inciting violence against Jews and other minorities. So I want to give you an overview of what ADL is doing to make that happen. ADL Center on Extremism, for decades and decades, has been studying the way extremists across the ideological spectrum exploit the online ecosystem to spread their messages, recruit adherents, finance hate, and commit acts of terror. Our Center for Technology and Society, a unit established by ADL in 2017 and based in Silicon Valley, has deep product and policy expertise. Its staff was recruited out of companies like Reddit, Twitter, and Yahoo. Its leadership has a background in computer science and software engineering. And we regularly generate research and advocacy-focused solutions that can make digital spaces and social media safer and more equitable. Our Center for Technology and Society recommends policy and product interventions to elected officials and directly to the technology companies. We drive advocacy efforts to hold the platforms accountable and push back push hate back to the periphery of society where it belongs. We produce data-driven applied research through our network of fellows and analysts. We bring to market technical tools and products designed by our engineers using their capabilities in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing in order to meet the need for crucial independent data measurement and analysis that allows us to track hate online just as ADL has been tracking off, hate offline for decades. And finally, we empower the targets of harassment. We work directly with the victims to enable them to more effectively respond to online incidents and push the platforms to create safer online spaces for all. One area where ADL has taken the lead is online gaming. The world of online gaming is much bigger than people imagine. As an industry, its revenues are larger than the movie business and the music business combined. ADL recently studied just one subset of games, online multiplayer games, which are today played by almost 100 million Americans uh, and 23 million teenagers between the ages of 13 and 17 years old. Alarmingly, 10% of teen gamers have witnessed discussions about white supremacist ideology in online multiplayer games. Our survey also found that 7% of adult gamers have come across Holocaust denial in discussions while they're playing games. Today, ADL is working with the leading gaming companies from Microsoft to Electronic Arts to numerous others. Our most recent contribution to the fight against online hate addresses the fact that manipulative design features are one significant way that platforms take advantage of consumers. So last month, ADL introduced our Social Pattern Library, a collection of design principles and user experience patterns intended to reduce hateful content on social media platforms. We've made this library available for free. It can be accessed from our website, adl.org. But it was developed in collaboration with leading user experience designers. We believe platforms should adopt these recommendations if they really do want to break the cycle in which hateful content is amplified through algorithms or similar features. Today, most social media companies engage in content moderation to enforce their policies using both artificial intelligence and human interventions. This year, ADL developed a report card on Holocaust denialism and anti-Semitic content to assess and evaluate the efficacy of these reporting systems. It might not surprise you, none of the platforms got good grades and some were actually quite poor. Well, we recently did a study and found that nearly 80% of Americans think new laws are needed to hold the social media companies accountable 
for recommending that users join extremist groups. ADL has developed a strategy that we call the repair plan that lays out an integrated agenda, a whole of society strategy to fight online hate and push violence and extremism back into the fringes of the digital world. There are several major components to our repair plan. Number one, regulator, regulation and reform that focuses on anti-discrimination measures, increased transparency, and other means of assuring accountability. Number two, enforcement at scale of content moderation. Number three, putting people over profit, which means platforms need to adjust their algorithms and stop recommending or amplifying organizations or content associated with extremism, disinformation, and hate, even if it results in less engagement and less profits. Number four, access to justice, which means changing the laws and the policies and the practices that deny victims meaningful access to the courts. When tech platforms allow perpetrators to abuse their targets, victims often have no place to go in the face of physical threats or emotional inju injury, let alone financial or reputational harm. Victims and targets have been denied due process because our cyber harassment laws are outdated or don't even exist. That must change. Number five, interrupting disinformation. While we need to end algorithmic amplification of hate, we also need more widespread media literacy and anti-disinformation education for all users at all ages. And then finally, research and innovation is crucial. There must be technology research and innovation aimed at fighting online hate. Just as privacy by design has been promoted with notable success, we think it's time for anti-hate by design to be promoted and widely incorporated into social media platforms. Thank you to everyone watching today for doing your part to address anti-Semitism and hate, both online and uh, on the ground in your communities. And we look forward to working with you and supporting you and all the Jewish people in 2022 and beyond. Thank you. Thanks to the ADL's Jonathan Greenblatt. And now Marina Yudborowski is a pivotal figure in the preservation of Eastern European Jewish culture. She herself was born in Ukraine and immigrated to the United States with her family as a young girl. She's played a vital role in strengthening Eastern European Jewelry and broadening its connections with the wider Jewish world. Today, as CEO of the Genesis Philanthropy Group. Ms. Yudborowski, we look forward to hearing your insights. Welcome to the forum. Hello. It is an honor to be able to speak here today, especially as it gives me the opportunity to think about the future, both its challenges and its opportunities. Nobody will be surprised if I say that the pandemic remains one of the major challenges for humanity and the Jewish world. But this is probably the only uncontroversial statement about the pandemic that I can make. About everything else, there is much disagreement between countries, communities, and even within families. And it is this polarization, only highlighted by the virus, which seems to me a more important topic to contemplate. Geopolitics, socioeconomics, and culture have always been controversial. Much of this controversy, I think, is healthy. It's how societies test out new ideas, internalize novel concepts, and evolve. But there are times when the controversy overflows into anger, violence, and intolerance. When we stop listening to one another and the fabric of society begins to tear. The 20th century saw genocide, world wars, and purges that devastated countries and continents. It also saw a backlash against colonialism, the civil rights movement, saw the creation of a new nation states, and attempts around the world to create more equality and access. We've had both good and bad. Challenges and opportunities abound. It is the polarization we see today that I wonder about. Is this polarization a part of a healthy adjustment to new norms, or is it a harbinger of death and destruction? And perhaps most importantly, what can we do to ensure that the disagreements of today are productive, building a more prosperous and just future? I wish I could say that these are general problems and not Jewish problems, that we Jews can just sit this one out. But unfortunately, we are right in the middle of it all. I see this as a major challenge for Jewish organizations all over the world to stay true to their commitments to support Israel and Jewish communities in their Jewish engagement, especially for the youth.
We must actively seek to preserve Jewish unity and fight alienation and pursue new forms of dialogue between Israel and the diaspora, as well as across Jewish communities all over the world. The other challenge I want to highlight is one of missed moments in our foundation's work to advance Jewish engagement and to create a more diverse and connected global Jewish community. We're especially focused on the needs of the new generation. The pandemic has had a myriad of disparate effects. While we have seen technology enable connection across vast distances, we've also seen isolation and alienation from community. Bridging these gaps as the pandemic continues is high on the priority list of most organizations. But there is more than just the immediate effect. As pandemic restrictions drag on, young people miss their opportunities for Jewish engagement because they simply come of age. How can we make up for these shortfalls in seminal Jewish experiences? These uh, are the questions that will define what our future Jewish community looks like. Some teens won't have had another chance to go to summer camp. Some students will never have their Taglit or Hillel experiences just because they've already stepped into the next period of their lives. It is our task and a challenge to come up with new creative solutions that will help to close this gap for the corona generation. So there we have it, the challenges of polarization between Jews around the world and of making up for the lost engagement opportunities of the pandemic, among other things, will undoubtedly keep us very busy in 2022 and beyond. I believe we're up to the task, and I believe that inside these challenges are also opportunities, opportunities to leverage technology, to engage a new generation in a conversation with their heritage, to take stock of what we want to retain from our pre-pandemic lives and what needs a refresh, to use the shared trials and tribulations of the pandemic to find common ground and envision a common destiny. I wish us all nothing but success as we tackle these individually and together. Thank you. And joining the conversation now is Mark Levine, Executive Vice Chairman and CEO of the National Coalition Supporting Eurasian Jewry. In 2008, Mr. Levine received Ukraine's Order of Merit. Two decades earlier, he was already a prominent advocate on behalf of persecuted Soviet Jews and a key organizer of the famous 1987 Freedom Sunday for Soviet Jews rally in Washington, D.C. Mr. Levine, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Hello from Washington, D.C. I want to thank the organizers of the Kiev Jewish Forum, and in particular, my friend and colleague Boris Lushkin, for inviting me to participate in this important event. It is also an honor to join such a distinguished group of government officials and NGO leaders in looking ahead to the challenges and opportunities in the coming year. I have traveled to Ukraine many times over the last 30 years, and I continue to marvel at the desire of its citizens to ensure their independence and their willingness to fight to keep their freedom. It has been 30 years since Ukraine announced its independence from the former Soviet Union, and 30 years since Ukraine and Israel began a formal diplomatic relationship. Even in the light of COVID and the other challenges confronting us today, this is a time for reflection and celebration. We celebrate the accomplishments of the Ukrainian Jewish community while being mindful that there is more to be done. Who could have imagined 30 years ago that one day there would be a thriving Jewish community in Ukraine, attending synagogues, going to day and Sunday schools, joining community centers and other institutions. But that is exactly what has happened today. Who also could have imagined that one day Ukraine would elect a Jewish president? But that is exactly what happened in 2019. Who could have imagined a strong bilateral relationship between Ukraine and Israel 30 years ago, based upon mutual trade and political needs? But that is exactly what happened and continues to happen today. We are living in a time of great success, while at the same time, important issues need to be addressed that will impact the lives of Ukrainian Jews. While state-sponsored anti-Semitism is non-existent in Ukraine, it doesn't mean anti-Semitism has disappeared. The government must continue to be vigilant against extremist ultranationalist groups from spreading their messages of hate. 
the Ukrainian government should be congratulated for the recent passage of a new law defining and punishing manifestations of anti-Semitism in Ukraine. This is, a, this is important as was the government's sponsorship and active participation in this year's 80th anniversary commemoration events of Bob and Yar. However, words alone are not enough. This new law must be enforced as well as other hate crime laws. Ultranationalists must not be allowed to honor individuals and groups that have blood on their hands from pogroms and the Holocaust. One of the challenges for Ukraine in 2022 will be to identify true heroes in Ukrainian history who were not responsible for the murder of thousands and thousands of Jews. Holocaust education should be a priority for all school-aged children. No country can move forward without an understanding of its past, both the good and the bad. Ukraine should join the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. IRA is only open to democratic states and it is only beneficial to Ukraine's standing to become a member. Ukraine and Israel need to continue to strengthen their political relationship by better understanding and respecting each other's security concerns. I'm very proud of NCSEJ's part in advancing the US-Ukrainian relationship over the last three decades. NCSEJ led the effort to graduate Ukraine from the jackson vanik Amendment granting permanent normal trade relations. NCSJ has and will continue to support financial and technical assistance to Ukraine. While Ukraine confronts many national security, economic and political challenges in the year ahead, it is important to remember in a region dominated by authoritarian government, it remains a shining example of freedom. Let us hope 2022 will be the year COVID is brought under control around the world, the Jewish community of, Ukra of Ukraine continues to grow and prosper, and Ukraine secures its place among the community of democratic states. Thank you very much. Well, as we mentioned earlier, the Kiev Jewish Forum has added meaning this year coming alongside a historic anniversary. 30 years ago, Israel was among the very first nations to recognize newly independent Ukraine after the breakup of the Soviet Union. On December 26, 1991, the two countries established official diplomatic ties. And since then, as you've heard, the relationship has blossomed from economics to culture, tourism, science, and to medicine. And to begin our closer look at those ties, we have the privilege of hearing from Ukraine's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Kuleba. Foreign Minister Kuleba, who is also a minister of Ukraine's National Defense and Security Council, will share some insights on the contemporary relationship between Israel and Ukraine. And Foreign Minister Kuleba, thanks so much for being with us. And I'll go ahead, first of all, and turn it over to you. Thank you for having me. I listened with pleasure and interest in, in interest to your previous discussion. Uh, allow me to deliver some, rem some remarks uh, dedicated to the bilateral relations between Ukraine and Israel. And as you absolutely rightly stated, this is a very special year for us, uh, 30 years since uh, establishment of diplomatic relations. And then I will be happy to, to answer your questions. <clears throat> so um, 30 years, uh, it's a relatively short historical period for two our states, but ties between our peoples are much deeper than that. Ukrainians and Jews uh, lived side by side for centuries, and our common history has both bright and dark pages. Both of our nations experienced terrible national catastrophes in the 20th century, such as the Holocaust and the Holodomor. One of the most dreadful tragedies is the Babin Yar massacre. Um, it doesn't matter how much we talk about uh, Babin Yar and how much uh, we are, how much truth we are revealing about what happened uh, on those uh, dark days. They will never be enough. This is the, the feeling that I had uh, during this year's ceremony. Uh, the commemorative ceremony at Babin Yar. And uh, every time you walk into that place, you feel the, the duty, 
the duty to work more and more on uh, bringing back truth uh, concealed uh, for decades during Soviet times. It's only the independent Ukraine that actually started uh, talking openly and opening uh, about this massacre and opening those tragic pages. I'm afraid if the Soviet Union had been still alive, uh, we would not have known the truth of Babin Yar and it would have not been widely, widely recognized. Babin Yar was a horrendous crime uh, of the Nazi regime committed on our soil 80 years ago. A couple of months ago, Ukraine, together with delegations from all over the world, including the president of the state of Israel, Isaac Herzog, other world leaders, representatives of international organizations, Holocaust witnesses, Ukrainians who saved Jews during the Nazi occupation, as well as the rightest among the nations from other countries, commemorated the innocent victims of Holocaust. We will keep the memory of the Babin Yard forever in order to prevent such atrocities from ever happening again. Ukraine strongly condemns all forms of intolerance and anti-Semitism. And the Ukrainian authorities at all levels make every effort to fight any of their manifestations. And we will continue to do so. We are absolutely confident that there is no place for anti-Semitism in Ukraine. Coming in a few days is the 73rd anniversary of the UN General Assembly Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide adopted on December 9, 1948. Rafael Lemkin, a Jewish Polish lawyer, was the one who gave this heinous crime a name and persuaded the General Assembly of the United Nations to outlaw it. And uh, Mr. Lemkin has his own connection with Ukraine as he spent some time in the beautiful city of Lviv. There are not only dark, but also bright pages in our common history that we can be proud of and that make ties between our states and nations so special. Needless to say that the Jewish community played a significant role in Ukrainian history and the prominent Jewish political, cultural and religious leaders of Ukrainian descent played a great role in the history of the state of Israel. Just to mention a few prominent Ukrainian born and raised Jewish figures, famous Jewish Zionist leader Zeev Jabotinsky, the second president of Israel, Itzhak Ben Zvi, famous Israeli defense minister Moshe Dayan, the third and the fifth prime ministers of Israel, Levi Eshkol and Golda Meir, the first Israel, Israeli foreign minister, Moshe Sharet. And I go, go, can go on and on with the list of uh, Jewish uh, prominent figures of Ukrainian descent. Of course, the Hasidic movement emerged in the territory of Ukraine, and uh, Ukraine was the point of departure for thousands of Jewish pioneers who went to Palestine to build the modern state of Israel. It therefore comes as no surprise that Israel was among the first countries to recognize Ukraine and to uh, establish diplomatic relations and to deepen our bilateral relations to the level where uh, we enjoy special partnership. We arrive at this 30th anniversary of the Ukrainian-Israeli relations with a proactive political dialogue at the highest level. Last year, President Zelensky visited Israel. And this year, Ukraine welcomed Israeli President Isaac Herzog. Rada and Knesset have regular contacts of friendship groups and secretariats. Next year, we expect exchange of visits of speakers of our parliaments. Ukraine is grateful for Israel's support of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity especially in the United Nations. We hope that Israel will eventually join the Crimea platform. I am particularly grateful to Jewish organizations of Ukraine for their support and in our efforts to defend Ukraine from Russia's aggressive expansionism. 
This year, the Ukraine-Israel free trade agreement entered into force. I must say that Ukraine has a similar bilateral for free trade agreement only with Canada, another country where uh, Ukraine has uh, millions of Ukrainians who create this special bond uh, between our countries. The result is evident. In just nine months of the 2021, our trade increased by 10%. The next logical step in, is the negotiations on expanding the FTA on services, not only goods. This can really boost trade between our countries for the benefit of our people. The Ukrainian side is ready to hold such negotiations. Lately, we have seen an inflow of Israeli investments in Ukraine. They now reached 100 million US dollars, but this is peanuts compared to what we can achieve. Ukraine is open for Israeli investors, and the government of Ukraine is committed to facilitating and protecting their investments. Both Israel and Ukraine are famous for their IT sectors. In a week, we will host the fourth Ukraine-Israel Innovation Summit, which will bring together entrepreneurs, technology businesses, government, and education representatives. Over 15,000 Ukrainian specialists are involved in the Israeli IT sector. This is one of the most promising spheres of our cooperation. Both Israel and Ukraine are also known for their agricultural technologies. Ukraine plays an important role as a supplier of grain to Israel. We now also launch a big irrigation project in the southern regions of Ukraine. We are open for more fruitful cooperation in this area. COVID-19 pandemic had a major negative impact on our people-to-people -people contacts over the past two years, but we now jointly work to restore them in full, in particular to create appropriate conditions for Jewish pilgrims to visit historical and holy places, including the organization of the annual pilgrimage of Braslav Hesets to Uman. We can really be proud of so many achievements, and we have even wider prospects ahead. Centuries-long friendship combined with today's mutually beneficial cooperation in many areas make the future of Ukraine-Israel relations very promising. There are no problems that we cannot discuss, and there are no problems that we cannot solve in relations between our countries. Thank you. Foreign Minister Kuleba, you've done such an eloquent job of laying out the history and the deep uh, sort of strong fabric that links together Israel and Ukraine and the people, not just the governments. So let me broaden it out uh, a little more. At this moment, given the geopolitical situation in the world, uh, and certainly with the, with the pandemic in the background, obviously, why is it so important, I mean, the significance of Ukraine's relationship with the United States and Europe at this particular moment in history? Well, I think that Israel, a country that uh, suffered from a number of uh, foreign aggression, aggressions, knows very well two things, that to be successful and to be able to defend your right to choose your way of life, uh, you need first to be strong and second to have strong friends. And this is the lesson that uh, we learned from our history, but also from the history of the state of Israel. And uh, in this context, uh, partnership with the United States of America is absolutely essential. Since 2014, the United States, uh, this is the beginning of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. The United States have become Ukraine's uh, partner number one in security and uh, political affairs. And uh, this year was particularly successful in our bilateral relations. We uh, reset the Commission for Strategic Partnership. We signed the new uh, Charter of Strategic Partnership that meets realities and needs of the, of the day. Uh, President of Ukraine visited uh, Washington. There are numerous contacts. So in these difficult times, uh, we have a partner whom uh, we can trust and who uh, is helping us to defend our sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, of course, uh, 
Um, we have we rec recently Ukraine's Minister of Defense visited Israel, and uh, we also believe that there are good preconditions for deepening our relations with Israel, not only in trade but also in military in defense sphere. There is, there is a lot of can there is a lot Israel can do. Many years ago, uh, Ukrainians helped uh, the state of Israel to stand on its foot on its feet. Uh, and uh, we are sure that in the most difficult moment, Israel will also help Ukraine to repel any attempts to put Ukraine on its knees. Foreign Minister Kuleba, thank you so much for taking part in this third Kiev Jewish Forum. And for all those words, thanks very much for taking part. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Next, we'll bring in an Israeli government official who has a personal connection to this forum. Zev Elkin is Minister of Jerusalem Affairs and Housing and Construction. He was born in Kharkiv, making Aliyah to the Jewish state after university. His story, just one more example, you've already heard many, of the intricate web of personal ties between Israel and Ukraine. Minister Elkin, welcome to the forum. Ukraine. Все время развивается, но у нас есть еще огромный потенциал, у нас очень много работы, поэтому это 30-летие, это возможность посмотреть ретроспективно назад, что было сделано за эти 30 лет, и главное подумать вместе, что мы можем сделать еще для того, чтобы использовать полный потенциал развития отношений между нашими странами, в котором, естественно, выходцы из Украины в Израиле и еврейская община Украины – это те два моста, которые связывают наши две страны. Thanks very much to Israeli Minister Zev Elkin. And the relationship between Ukraine and Israel is not just about governments, as you've heard. It's, of course, about people. Ukraine has been a major source of immigration to Israel over the decades, with an estimated half a million people of Ukrainian descent living in the Jewish state today. Weighing in with some more context on that is Israel's Minister of Immigrant Absorption, Pnina Tamano Shata. Minister Tamano Shata, thanks very much for being with us. I'll turn it over to you. שלום וברכה לכל באי הכנס פורום קייב באוקראינה. ברצוני לברך את כל המשתתפים בברכת הצלחה וברכה גם בכנס ובכלל בכל ימות השנה. ברשות בוריס לוזקין, נשיא הקונפדרציה של יהודי אוקראינה, רוברט סינגר, יושב ראש המרכז לאימפקט יהודי, סשה רויטמן, מנכ"ל התנועה למאבק באנטישמיות. אנחנו בעצם מציינים 30 שנה לכינון היחסים עם אוקראינה, מאז עלו לישראל למעלה מ-200 אלף יהודים. כל אחד מהם הוא ברכה לישראל ולחברה הישראלית, מנוע צמיחה לאומי, כלכלי, חברתי. אנחנו גם מציינים השנה 30 שנה לעלייה מברית המועצות לשעבר. העולים החדשים הם הכוח החלוץ. מאז קום המדינה וגם בימים האלה לבניית חברה ישראלית חזקה. יש לי את הזכות להיות שרת העלייה והקליטה ולחבר בין קצוות תבל בציונות, בחיבור האנושי, במגוון העשיר והמיוחד של העם היהודי. אני רוצה לברך את כל הארגונים ואת באי הכנס על העבודה הנפלאה שלכם לחיזוק הקהילה היהודית אך לא רק. להמשך עידוד העלייה לישראל. הגורל שלנו תלוי זה בזה, וממשלת ישראל נותנת דגש מאוד גדול גם לעלייה וקליטה, אבל גם לקשר בין התפוצות. על כך אני מודה לכם שאתם שותפים עיקרים. איחולי ברכה והצלחה ממני פנינה תמנו שטה, כאמור שרת העלייה והקליטה. Thanks so much to Israel's Minister Tamano Shata. And let's keep focus on Jerusalem. Joining us now from there is Israel's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Idan Roll. Deputy Minister, thanks so much for being here today. Mr. Boris Goshkin, initiator and chairman of the forum, distinguished members of the forum, 
This year marks 30 years of diplomatic relations between Israel and the Ukraine, and their relationship grows stronger with time. Recently, President Yitzhak Herzog even paid a very significant visit to Ukraine. We have a shared cultural and political history, as some of the main figures of the State of Israel originate in Ukraine. Zev Jabutinsky, President Ben Tzvi, Prime Ministers Moshe Sharet, Levi Eshkol, and Golda Meir. The cooperation between our countries is expressed in a growing number of areas, such as political, economic, cultural, knowledge sharing in the fields of health and technology. A few days ago, a high-level Ukrainian delegation led by the Minister of Defense arrived in Israel to sign agreements and protocols for economic and other cooperation. The visit and the agreements signify the continuation of promoting relations between the two countries. The corona plague has caused suffering and restrictions in both countries. This is another field where we are more than willing to share knowledge and experience with Ukraine and are ready to expand cooperation between government bodies, hospitals and commercial companies. Unfortunately, a significant part of the common past of both nations is related to the horrors of World War II. We welcome the memorial event in Ukraine to mark the 80th anniversary of the Babi Yar tragedy. Some 34,000 Jewish men, women and children were killed in mass shootings on the outskirts of the capital, Kiev, on the last two days of September 1941. It is important to mention that in Ukraine today live thousands of people who helped and saved Jews during World War II. We provide assistance in locating them and award them and their families the title of Righteous Among the Nations. These are real heroes, and they are the heroes that Ukraine should be proud of. At the same time, the struggle must continue against manifestations of the anti-Semitism that sometimes raises its ugly head as well as the combat against the glorification of Ukrainian heroes who were collaborators with the Nazis. We congratulate Ukraine on the adoption of a law to prevent and combat anti-Semitism based on the working definition of IRA. Thank you to the President of Ukraine for his commitment to the fight against anti-Semitism. Last but not least, it is worth noting the contribution of the Jewish community in Ukraine and the community of Ukrainians in Israel for their contribution to strengthening ties between the two countries. We're now honored to have with us here Israeli ambassador to Ukraine, Michael Brodsky. Formerly Israel's envoy to Kazakhstan, Ambassador Brodsky presented his credentials in Kiev back in August and quickly got to work on nurturing the close bonds between Israel and Ukraine. Ambassador Brodsky, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. So, I mean, you really have a front row seat to this relationship that we're talking about over these two days, uh, where, you know, its status is now, where it's heading. Share with us a bit of your take on the importance of Israel's ties to Ukraine. Well, first of all, I'd like to use this opportunity to congratulate the organizers of the uh, Kiev Jewish Forum and, uh, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Loshkin, with this uh, uh, wonderful event and an important event since uh, uh, this year on December 26th, we mark 30th anniversary of the diplomatic relations between uh, Israel and Ukraine. And I believe that uh, uh, over these 30 years, we managed to reach a uh, not only high level of relationship, but I would describe it as a family type of relationship, a very close, intimate relationship between the leaders of our countries between the business communities, the politicians, but what is most important between uh, the two people. And uh, uh, as you know, about half a million of uh, former Ukrainian citizens uh, currently live in Israel. And uh, uh, on the other hand, there is a vibrant and active Jewish community in uh, uh, Kiev and other Ukrainian uh, cities. And these two communities, they create a vital and uh, an amazing human bridge, which uh, turns our relations from, uh, you know, formal uh, relations based on interests into something much bigger than this, into something which is based on mutual sympathy, on uh, 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 mutual history, and uh, which is something that indeed is unique. And I really want to praise this uh, wonderful relationship between our countries. 
Uh, I've been in Ukraine only uh, four months, but uh, just to illustrate the intensity of our relationship, I would like to mention only a few events which uh, have happened over the last uh, over the last month. Uh, I will start with uh, mentioning the pilgrimage to Uman something uh, that happens every year, but this year it was especially complicated because on the one hand, people were allowed to come to Uman and more than 30,000 pilgrims from Israel came to uh, Uman to pray uh, on uh, Rabbi Nachman uh, uh, grave. On the other hand, we had to deal with the uh, limit, limits and with the uh, rules and, and limitations uh, 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 related to Corona, both on the Ukrainian side and on the Israeli side, which was indeed very complicated, and only thanks to the uh, synergy between uh, the uh, two countries, the police of the two countries, uh, the security forces, we managed to uh, uh, conduct it smoothly without any major incidents, and I'm happy that uh, uh, everything went uh, uh, well this year. Uh, then, uh, in uh, uh, the beginning of October, there was the first visit of the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, uh, to Ukraine, dedicated to the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of Babi Yar. But uh, uh, it also, uh, also was a state visit, and uh, his first visit as a president outside of the country, which is uh, very, very symbolic and very important. Uh, then, just recently, we had a visit of the uh, Minister of Defense, the newly appointed Minister of Defense, Mr. Reznikov, uh, uh, to Israel, a very um, fruitful and a very, uh, um, very meaningful visit, uh, uh, which, which happened uh, only last week. Uh, then we had celebrations of uh, the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah across the country, in all major cities uh, across Ukraine. So as you see, our bilateral agenda is packed, is very intense, and I believe that the next year will be also very interesting in terms of the bilateral relations. We are discussing a possibility of uh, Mr. Zelensky's uh, visit uh, uh, Israel and uh, uh, probably Mr. Bennett, uh, the Israeli prime minister, who hasn't uh, visited Ukraine yet, will come and pay an official visit uh, uh, to Ukraine, and so on and so forth. So the next year, I believe, will be very interesting in terms of the bilateral relations. And uh, of course, most of the events will be dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the uh, diplomatic relations between Israel and Ukraine. Sure, something that we're going to be talking about uh, more in the course of this forum. Ambassador Brodsky, thanks so much for that and, and for a really an important reminder that the relationship between countries is much more about people than about governments. It's really much more important uh, and that's certainly the case with Ukraine and Israel. And of course, you're welcome to Absolutely. stay online and, and listen to the guests ahead. We next have the honor of welcoming Ambassador Brodsky's counterpart, Ukraine Ambassador to Israel, Yevgen Kornichuk. Ambassador Kornichuk, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for being Thank with Thank you us. for inviting me. So give us a bit of your take on the ties as they stand now between the countries, between Ukraine and Israel, and, and maybe where you hope to see it going forward. Well, I'm glad to say that uh, they never been as strong as they are at the moment. We are enjoying the full cooperation in many fields uh, of uh, mutual interest. So uh, endless amount of questions back and forth, uh, invitations uh, over delegations, uh, official and business people coming on uh, back and forth. So uh, I have to admire the... Uh, Good cooperation in the agricultural field, uh, assuming that uh, the biggest amount of the trade is happening between Israel and Ukraine, uh, uh, Ukraine exporting the agricultural goods, as well as uh, the good cooperation in uh, the medical field. So, assuming that uh, assistance and the mutual cooperation on uh, uh, the issues related to the fighting of the COVID. 19 infection. So uh, lots of different things going on at the moment. Uh, we just had official delegation uh, of Ukraine last week having the session of the Intergovernmental Economical Commission that was headed with the Minister of Defense, Mr. Reznikov. So I assume that we will enjoy much broader uh, security cooperation between two countries as well. 
so and uh, I'm honestly proud to be the part of this process and I'm, I'm willing to move ahead as quickly as possible. You mentioned, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, 19 pandemic and, and the cooperation on health. It's one of the, the many things and elements of cooperation between Ukraine and Israel that we're talking about in this two-day forum. If I mean, you as somebody, an ambassador who's really on the front line and an insider to the relationship, looking forward, is there a particular area of cooperation that you think we should be looking at or or that you think uh, is really has the most potential for more cooperation going forward? First of all, uh, I have to admit, I told that a few times already, that the first 20 million uh, of Pfizer vaccine, Ukraine have got uh, with the Israeli assistance, believe it or not, because the previous prime minister called uh, to the head of the New York office and they, we arranged the phone call between uh, Mr. Burla and uh, President Zelensky and got oh. the contract at the beginning of this year. A very important phone call. Uh, yes, exactly. So uh, I, I appreciate this initiative for the Israeli side. And currently we are having uh, together working on uh, the widgets and the uh, new vaccine uh, 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 medical trial in Ukraine of the Israeli origin. So uh, our ministries are working hard together. We exchange the information on a daily basis and uh, we are very much appreciate Israeli assistance that we are doing anything what is possible from our side in order to advance this cooperation that should be mutually uh, amicable for both parties. Sure, no, in no area more than health and certainly in fighting this pandemic that has created cooperation between countries that uh, even, as you say, even two nations with such close ties before that really have to step it up to deal with with such a situation. Uh, if we're looking forward uh, in terms of economics uh, on that front, those are that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about here. Uh, you know, startups, Israel is a startup nation and things that can be learned for Ukraine. Uh, are there anything, I know there's already a lot of uh, business cooperation or is that, is that a field that you think, uh, you know, should be focused on in the future or stepped up a little bit? Um, December 15, next week, we will be holding the first Israeli-Ukrainian uh, innovation and Investment Summit. I am saying it first because of it happened actually four times already, but it was focused just in innovation, in the high tech. Right. This time we will be focusing not just on the high tech, we will be having the different panels, including the uh, health, uh, where the Ukrainian Minister of Health will be participating. An additional panel would be on a construction business. And you, as you know, Israelis are very heavily investing in the Ukrainian sure. uh, construction. So uh, I will uh, welcome all the participants that are interested to take care, uh, to take part in this event. Uh, so I think it's a much broader way to cooperate uh, in the issues related to the energy. So very Isra important issue for the future. Certainly. Israel just show the great experience, expertise together with Americans' uh, extraction on the shelf of the uh, Mediterranean. Right. The gas started just a few years ago, and now they're exporting gas to the other nations. So we uh, will be welcoming the Israeli-American presence on the shelf of the Black Sea, uh, Ukrainian national uh, waters, yeah. in order to do, do the similar exercise. So that would help both countries to our prosperity and, and uh, uh, en energetical independence, if you wish. Sure. Those are all uh, things you mentioned that are so critical to both countries' futures, whether it's health, that everybody has learned that a lot of things need to change going forward to deal with the maybe the inevitable ne next pandemic and, of course, energy security and so forth. So December 15th, that Innovation Forum uh, exactly. sounds like something to watch for. Ambassador uh, Kornichuk, thanks so much for being with her. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And now back to Ukraine. We welcome to the forum head of the Diplomatic Academy of Ukraine and Ukraine's former ambassador to Israel, Gennady Nadolenko. Ambassador Nadolenko, thanks so much for joining us today. Shalom, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, dear friends, uh, dear ministers, dear ambassadors, dear Mr. Loshkin and uh, Robert Zinger, thank you both for this invitation to the third edition of this uh, Kiev Jewish Forum. I'm uh, really happy to speak here, especially on the eve of 30th anniversary of establishment of uh, diplomatic relations between 
our two countries, which we will celebrate very soon on 26th of uh, December this year. Uh, Ukraine and Israel uh, have long numerous links uh, between our two countries, uh, religious, economic, historical, uh, basically anything you name. Uh, we are two states that were born on the ruins of the last world empires. Israel in 1948, uh, the independent Ukraine in 1991, but we both have a thousand old uh, year old history, which uh, includes many aspects of our cooperation and the understanding between each other. Uh, before World War II, Ukraine was home to millions of Jews, a place where the the Jewish culture was thriving, and uh, I'm sure it will be like that years to come. And uh, as my minister said previously, Ukraine uh, is the country of origin for prominent, uh, for many prominent Jews, uh, artists, religious, political leaders. Uh, he named uh, all of them, so I will not repeat all, um, all of them. But uh, definitely for Ukrainians, Israel uh, has also been a very important place, place and remains a place of pilgrimage, a place of power, uh, where lots of uh, Ukrainian citizens found home, uh, fall in love, found peace and uh, prosperity, and so on. Uh, nowadays, all established links uh, have remained. And uh, I'm confident they will only develop in the future. Our countries have many similarities uh, and they have many similar challenges. Sometimes in Ukraine, Israel has been referred as the transformation role model and the country that managed uh, to achieve prosperity amid uh, permanent armed conflicts. Unfortunately, Russia-Ukrainian conflict has been uh, going on uh, for as long as eight years already and has taken many lives of uh, Ukrainian citizens. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Israel for providing and continu continuing support, support to Ukraine, especially in medical assistance. And it's not only uh, the treatment of woodmen, uh, wounded Ukrainians in Israel and the uh, internship of uh, Ukrainian doctors in Ukraine in Israeli hospitals, but also about assisting in implementing clinical and training programs in uh, Ukrainian military and uh, civilian hospitals and much, much more. For us, it's uh, very, very important. So please continue with that. Um, I was uh, ambassador of Ukraine to State of Israel for uh, more than 10 years and uh, all this uh, time uh, I tried to bring our bilateral relations to the highest level uh, and strengthen our economic, political, cultural cooperation and many, many other uh, ways of our cooperation. And now when I look back, I see a lot of positive results of the uh, work of our team. Uh, and today I would like to prize um, our new ambassadors for, uh, from both sides for their wonderful job and continuing uh, on this track. Uh, thanks to this cooperation, our contacts now are on the highest level. They look powerful and friendly. Also, the trade and economic cooperation is developing. Uh, notwithstanding pandemic crisis, this year we managed to organize a few very important visits, especially the visit of the President of Israel to Ukraine and the recent meeting of the Trade and Economic Commission in Israel. Thanks to such cooperation, the total trade you know, between Ukraine and Israel has grown uh, gradually, um, I want to say that 30 years uh, not a lot for a country, but uh, it's not little either. During this time, we learned uh, a lot about uh, our countries, about our people. We tried to understand each other. We learned from each other uh, and help each other. Uh, we are discussing hard questions and uh, hard questions of the past and look with optimism in the future. 
And I hope we will continue to do so. And I hope this future will be bright for our nations uh, for many, many years ahead. And uh, here I really would like to thank again uh, Kiev Jewish Forum and its organizers for doing exactly that, bringing our countries closer, bringing our people and nation, nations closer together. Uh, please continue doing so for many, many years until 120. Best wishes to all of you. I wish all of you happy Hanukkah, happy new year. Thank you very much to all of you. Todaraba, duje dyakuyu. Thanks so much. It's very nice to hear that you are seeing the fruits of your labor after 10 years of ambassador in that role. Thanks so much, Ambassador Nadolenko, for being part of this conversation. Thank you. And finally, let's hear from Misha Galbrin, president and CEO of the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History, also a senior advisor to the combat anti-Semitism movement. Misha, I know you also have a personal connection to this region. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Presidents Zelensky and Herzog, ministers, ambassadors, world leaders, and honored guests. Uh, I'm Dr. Misha Galperin, or in Ukrainian, Mikhailo Davidovich Halperin, or in Ivrit, Moshe Ben David. I was born and raised in the city called the Pearl of the Black Sea, or in Odessan dialect, Odessa Mama. One of the most Jewish cities in the world, and also one of the most international, cosmopolitan with Greeks, Italians, Turks, Germans, Russians and Ukrainians, along with Jews being there from its founding back in the 18th century. Not a melting pot, uh, but a gorgeous mosaic. Everyone reaching some level of integration, but also retaining their own identity. Odessa was once the only place in the Russian Tsarist Empire where Jews were actually not just allowed to live, but were enticed to immigrate to. They were never strangers in Odessa, but among its founders and leading citizens. A noted sociologist once wrote that Jews of Odessa are more like the Jews of San Francisco than they're like Jews of Moscow. They always felt they belonged at least until the pogroms of 1905. I'm also a great son of, grandson of Rabbi Moshe Rabinovich of the shtetl of Tamashpal in the Vinnitsa Oblast, halfway between Odessa and Kiev. He was murdered by the Einsatztruppen along with 400 of his congregants and family on August 4th, 1941 in what has become known as Holocaust by bullets, at the edge of a ravine, much like Babin Yar in Kiev. My father, who watched the massacre from a mulberry tree and dreamt about it every night for the next 50 years, was the only survivor. In 1957, he married my mother, a descendant of German reform, Jewish engineers, musicians, and physicians, brought to Odessa in the mid-19th century to help build the southern window to Europe. We came to the U.S. as refugees from the Soviet regime in 1976. I'm very proud of the fact that when I was getting my U.S. citizenship in the early 80s, I put Ukraine as my country of origin, way before the Soviet Union fell apart and Ukraine became independent. When I was in Kiev for the historic Board of Governors of the Jewish Agency of Israel meetings, where I served as deputy to Natan Sharansky, another Ukrainian Jew, I went on a tour with a local guide who told us that the very first written mention of Kiev was found in a Jewish document. The so-called Kievan letter discovered by the famous, in the famous Cairo Geniza a cemetery for sacred Jewish documents that became frayed but cannot be destroyed because they contain the name of God. It was discovered by Solomon Schechter, a great Jewish scholar, and it was a letter to the Kievan Jewish community describing the author's efforts to redeem his brother held at the debtor's jail in Kiev for taxes he owed. Pidion Shvuim 
uh, redeeming of the captives is the highest religious duty a Jew has because of our reverence for life and in order to reassure that neither the captive nor his family would suffer torture and other hardships. I'm not entirely sure that it is, in fact, the first written mention of the great city, but it is a testament of how far back our people's history in the Ukraine goes back. So the establishment of diplomatic relations between the Jewish state and the Ukrainian state 30 years ago is what only should have been all along. Ukraine was home to extraordinary Jewish figures from Baal Shem Tov, to Nachman of Bratislav, to the Lubavitcher dynasty, to Shalom Aleichem, also born Rabinovich, like my grandfather, and my grandfather's cousin, according to family history, though a black sheep in a Hasidic family. To Leon Pinsker, whose Zionist ideas preceded Theodor Herzl's. Jabotinsky, Bialik, Sholem Ash, Ilya Ilf, Isaac Babel, and the great pianists and violinists of Odessa school founded and named after Pinchas Stalarsky. I was thrown out of the school for bad behavior when I was six years old, in spite of my mother being a graduate and my grandmother teaching there for many years. And my grandmother's students at the Odessa Conservatory, Emil Gils, Bela Davidovich, David Oistrach, Misha Elman, Etc. As one American Jewish joke goes, a cultural exchange between the Soviet Union and the US is when they send us their Jewish violinists from Odessa and we send them our Jewish violinists from Odessa. And now, to have the president of Ukraine being Jewish? Is Bushy Herzog Ukrainian? No? Polish? Well, nobody's perfect. Seriously, with the Babin Yar site finally getting its due, with the revival of Jewish religious and cultural life through synagogues, Jewish community centers, museums, restoration of cemeteries, and a robust and growing business relationship between Ukraine and Israel and Ukraine and the U.S., might I be able to reclaim my Ukrainian citizenship in addition to my American one? When leaving the USSR in 1975, we had to pay for the privilege of giving up Soviet citizenship, because USSR and Israel, who sent us the invitations to immigrate, had no diplomatic relations. Congratulations to all involved on behalf of the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History, where I serve as the CEO and my colleagues at American and Jewish Foundations and NGOs I work with, particularly the co-sponsors of this forum, Combat Antisemitism Movement. We're building it as a movement like the one that led to freedom for Soviet Jewry, the defeat of Parthed in South Africa, the movements that led to the establishment of the Jewish state, as well as the movements that led to the fall of the Berlin Wall, the color revolutions, and the independence and democratization of Ukraine. May all three allies, Ukraine, Israel, and the United States, continue to build their relationship, and as our sages say, may we go from strengths to strengths. Or, as I found out when studying at Yeshiva University in New York, in the words of what is a priestly blessing, and I discovered my relationship to the Kohanim by seeing this on the screen. As Mr. Spock of Star Trek used to say, live long and prosper. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Misha Galperin, thanks so much for that. What a personal story you have, and uh, what a beautiful way you've woven it together with your work uh, at the National Museum. Thanks so much for joining the forum. Thank you for having me. And with that, we've come to the close of day one of the 2021 Kiev Jewish Forum, hosted by the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine, the Center for Jewish Impact, and the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. We hope you found today's dialogue engaging and informative, and of course that you'll join us again right here tomorrow for the second and final day of the forum. We'll hear about the fight against hate speech, Israel's high-tech prowess as a startup nation and its lessons learned, the two countries' collaborative efforts to tackle urgent health challenges, including, of course, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the critical importance of promoting Jewish education. Remember, if you missed anything today, you'll get a recap in your inbox and a full recording of the two-day event will be up online on the forum's website, kievjewishforum.com. I'm Nareet Ben. Thanks so much for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you again right here 
tomorrow.